Mr. McCulkin. How you doing today? Fine, Mr. Wellborn. How are you? It's good to see you. I'm glad that you could make it to another episode of Power Athlete Radio. I'm very excited for this one. Are you? Well, I get to show off a little bit. Ah, you get to kick up your heels and show us... Uh, well, little... in the show notes, <laughs> I'll provide proof of what we're presenting today. Uh, dude, I'm actually excited for this one. I know we game planned a little bit, but... Um... We definitely am reaping some gold from the Power Athlete Hotline. So for those of you guys who have been, have been living under a rock, and this is your first episode of Power Athlete Radio, we have this little thing called the Power Athlete Hotline where you, the loyal listener, will call in and leave us questions, text us, and just be able to communicate anything to try to get your questions answered. And then we'll go through them. We usually pick the best ones. And the ones that we're feeling for that day. And I think we got a good one queued up. So if you're interested in hitting up that hotline, 929-464-464. Zero. Zero. 929-ing-ing. Zero. All right, we got it. I mean, dude, you you dozed off on me a little bit. I would figure I'd I have to like... Uh, I was reading the question. But uh, give you a little resuscitation. So those of you guys interested, check out the hotline, leave us a question, and we got a pretty good one. So without further ado... Uh-huh. It's all about the home gym today, John. Mm. And- you know that speaks to me. That I mean, <laughs> it's 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 near and dear to our heart. We love the home gym. Ready, ready. Let's do it. Hey, John, Tech, and the rest of Power Athlete HQ. This is Josh from Denver, North Carolina. I've been listening for years. I appreciate the consistent pursuit of athletic performance and challenging the bullshit. I have a question about the HQ building. My wife and I are planning to add a thirty by thirty metal building to expand our gym and shop space. At least half. Of the, of the building will be for the gym. I see from pictures you use a metal building so much larger than ours. Were there any special considerations or adjustments, adjustments you made to your building to make it more suitable as a gym? For the time being, three people will use this space. Me, my wife, and her nephew. My wife tends toward more CrossFit style training, so I'm trying to convince her to do lean and able when she's a little further down the postpartum track. Her nephew and I follow Field Strong or programs like it. Again, thank you for doing what you do. Bye. By Denver, wow. North Carolina. Denver, North Carolina. Yeah, where you know, <laughs> where the beer flows like wine and the women that, swoom like the salmon of San Juan Capistrano. That was it. That was it. Uh, I I could see it. Uh, uh, like uh, yeah, coming. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the best lines ever from uh, Dumb and Dumber. Uh, man, okay. Um, what? How big is thirty by thirty? Uh, it's nine hundred square feet. And your building is is ninety two by fifty. So in uh, with the awning, so it's eighty by fifty inside, ninety two by fifty with the awning. And how big is the gym side? The gym side is half, so figure forty by fifty. Oh yeah, what did I say? Ninety two by or sorry, uh, ninety two. So eighty by fifty, so forty by fifty. Yep. Okay. So, so forty by fifty. So he's thirty by thirty, nine hundred square feet. So I think all in, um, we are what, uh, 80 by 50 would be what, 4,000 square feet. So add another, you know, uh, what would be uh, 92 by 50 would give us what, 45. No, it didn't. Yeah, yeah. So a little over 4,500 square feet. I can't believe I'm all on that mouse. going to upset me. Um, well. 90 by 92. So 4,600 square feet is how big the, the footprint is where they poured the slab. Nice. And this gentleman's got a plenty of room to yeah, work with. Yeah, so 900 square feet for three people is huge. I mean, the way our gym is designed, uh, we stacked all the equipment on the outside so we could keep the space, center. Well, space is so valuable when it comes to... Well, but when we're, you know, we have block one events, mm-hmm. we've done symposiums. I mean, the amount of stuff that we've done that uses the gym, uh, you know, for more than just being a gym really re- requires and necessitates that we have an open floor space. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if we wanted to just pack it like the rocks fucking iron paradise, I mean, you could just have rows and rows. I mean, we could have equipment for days. Right. And our first thought was Gunnar Peterson's mm. beautiful facility, which I believe uh, is at his home base. Yeah. that uh, Every time I see Gunnar's gym on Instagram, it gives me a little bit of like anxiety. Because it's so packed. There's well, you don't so understand much. the system. <laughs> okay, explain to me the system. Uh, I don't either. But each equipment, uh, you know, there's pathways. 
and there's numbers on the equipment. You can't get lost. It's like a Costco. It reminds me, uh, my buddy Rick from Starling Gear, he uh, traveled and was like Billy Gibbons' personal jeweler for a number of years and went on the road with the guys from ZZ Top. And uh, he said Billy Gibbons' house, because Billy Gil- Gibbons was like a collector of memorabilia. Uh, and he would just like hoard it. He had like several. Was homes. it in Houston? Uh, I think it was another Houston guy. Yeah, they, they are Houston. Uh, but he's owned homes everywhere. I bet. And what he does is he owns a home. He fills it up with stuff. And when it's packed full of stuff, burns he just goes to the and, ground. No, he goes and buys a new house. Oh. So he's had several houses just packed with stuff. But Rick was saying last time he went over there, there was like a clear path to where because it was just so much stuff. And he's like, dude, you're almost gonna, you're almost ready for a new house. Oh, so, new uh, TV show idea, Jim Hoarders. Our first episode, Gunnar Peterson. Gunnar Peterson, and the second episode is uh, Coop. A Coop from uh, <laughs> Jim Jim Garage Reviews. Oh my God, he's got a lot of equipment. Uh, the next one would be Bert Soren. So, oh yeah, um, that's great. The so let's let's start from the ground up. Obviously, right. you need a place to build it. So he says he has property. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't at least throw this out there uh, when you build the building. Make sure that it's in a certain place that if it's close to a property line, you've gone and talked to your neighbors about, hey, we're going to build this. Is this a problem? So we're really lucky. Our neighbors uh, are 60 horses in a a, a riding school that gets used as a commercial business. And uh, Doug and Kelly, who live up on the property, are neighbors and they are the best neighbors. Um, I have a, a, I remember when I moved out here to Texas. Uh, my old neighbor, uh, Cecil Perkins, told me that um, uh, the best thing about living in Texas, or he said, um, God, what was that? I forgot exactly how he put it, but he said, um, l- when you live in Texas, you don't have to ask another man what you can do on your property. The day that you have to ask another man what to do on your property, you're not living in Texas. Because I came over to him and I was like, hey, we're going to build this building and I'm going to put up a shop and do this. Is this a problem? And he's like, why are you asking me? It's on your property. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, I'm from California where people make it their priority what's going on in your property, not what's in there. Like everybody's more curious what's going on in your fucking life than they are on their own. And he's like, you do whatever you want to do and we'll be more than happy to support you. So I've taken that approach with not only my neighbors, but everybody else. Like, hey, whatever you do on your property is fine. I'm going to do what I do on my property. Don't, uh, you know, don't worry about me. So we built this building. So I had to pick a good spot. There was really only one spot on the property that was easily accessible that I could build this big a building. Now, in hindsight, I wish I'd built the building bigger, but that was about as big as I was <laughs> going to get. Uh, foundation. So I knew that I was going to put a lift in, in the shop. I knew we were going to have uh, heavy things in there. and We were going to drop weights and do everything. So when I had the pad specced out, I remember number three rebar on 12 inch centers. And we used, I want to say like a five or a 6,000 PSI, a higher uh, strength, like a, a higher tensile strength of concrete. Mm-hmm. So uh, I paid extra to have uh, like a higher PSI of concrete. And then the other thing we did is uh, I had the floor saw cut. So, you know, uh, over time concrete moves. And so right. when, when you have... Uh, big slabs of concrete. Concrete's always going to crack, so we put a ton of saw cuts in. If, so that if I remember it. correctly, we saw cut that, or at least a no, portion of it. No, the, outs- the outside, at least. The outside, Tom Dye uh, saw cut it. Uh, crooked what, as fuck. What, I think the beginning was Luke and I crooked as fuck, and then no, you tapped in the pros. No, uh, we never saw cut it. Uh, Tom brought his machine down, because I should have had the guy that poured the concrete saw cut it on the outside. But the inside, they saw cut the inside. What we did is I filled all of the saw cuts with grout. Okay. Do you remember that? Yeah, I just remember yeah. vaguely participating in something that yeah. was not qualified or capable of. Yeah, there's no, that's happened numerous <laughs> times from, from everything we've done around here. But uh, so what I did is because I knew the, the pad was going to be big, uh, we spec'd it out in such a way uh, that I knew that, you know, we were going to have, you know, basically tough enough concrete. Um, now Tom Dye, my old neighbor was, uh, extremely helpful for me just cause I didn't know shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm coming out here from California where like, I mean, I've never had to build a building. So to have him come out and do the dirt work and, uh, you know, go out and talk to me about the finer points of 30 years of pouring concrete was, you know, uh, probably 
one of the best educations that I could have gotten. And then also being able to, to get coached up a little bit on how to run equipment. So now I can run skid steers and all that. I just had never done it. It wasn't mm-hmm. that I couldn't, I just never had the opportunity. So uh, having him come down and showing me how to do it and this, and this is how you do it was really helpful. But so then once the concrete was in, um, we went, we put a sealer on it, which that sealer was allegedly supposed to increase the tensile strength of it. Um, so I found this pretty cool sealer that was by definition supposed to make it a harder, more durable. So I sealed it. Then from there, uh, I had Mueller do my building. So Mueller buildings who's here. And, uh, I don't know if they're outside of Texas, but I went and looked at two or three other different manufacturers of building mm-hmm. and the Mueller stuff was just much more high quality. I went in and looked at two other buildings that were not Mueller buildings and it was noticeable just like being able to feel the material and look and like the red iron and it just like you can see the quality in the building. So uh, that was pretty dope. Um, it came up, remember we put up the red iron and then we sheeted it and uh, ran the gavelume on the outside which would have been powder coated. And then once the building was up, we did, we put the garage doors in and then I had the whole thing spray foamed. So six to eight inches of closed cell spray foam through the entire building, which just added a huge amount of rigidity. And then we skinned over that because I hate looking at spray foam, but yet I like spray foam because it, uh, it seals up all the cracks. I mean, when it rains and you know, something hits the roof, we don't hear it. I don't know if you've ever been in a metal building that doesn't have, it's not been spray foamed. Like you couldn't even have a conversation when it's raining. Mm -hmm. So it's super quiet in the gym. And then we put all that skin up with Galvalume on the inside. So um, my old neighbor or Tom Dye in his building, he did the same thing. He did, uh, he had, he had skin and then he had fiberglass uh, bat and then he skinned over the bat, but he ended up removing the skin, going back and spray foaming it because he brought in, uh, he, he ended up air conditioning his building. Right. So his comment to me was design the building and build it. Because the cost, like, uh, you know, maybe a few bucks more to do the, the spray foam, but like the amount of um, like the ceiling and just like the efficiency of spray foam was so much higher. And his comment was, you might not want to AC this building today, but 10 years from now, you might decide to do it. You don't want to have to go back and do the work that he did to get his AC ready. And our friend here calling in, he's from Toledo. So 419 area code where we know it snows i don't know how hot it gets but if you can protect yourself from the the cold let's benefit right there yeah the other thing we did here in texas obviously is uh, i put in a macro air fan so um you know big ass fans is kind of like the you know everybody's heard of standard standard you go into a gym they got these big fans the problem is is that the big ass fans put out a ton of decibels and they're real loud so I researched and I found macro air fans, which moved as much, but it was like half the decibels. So what I didn't want to be is in the gym, like, you know, it's hot. We're in there giving a, a block one or having an event and it sounds like a fucking, you know, planes about to take off. It's like, whoo, whoo, whoo. so I ended up getting that big ass macro air fan, which thank God uh, I ordered way too big a one. And the problem is I didn't have enough pitch in my roof. So that's when I had to weld that big flat plate up there and then mm-hmm. build that drop down. So it's nice to have a metal shop to be able to build this stuff. But I welded a flat plate cause obviously it peaked. And then we bolted that macro air fan similar to like we did here in the barn. And uh, that pushes a ton, a ton of air. It's great. Yeah, no, it's great. And then you open up the garage doors. Um, I put that badass aluminum door on the, uh, like where the porch is. I, I would have loved to have done those aluminum doors through the entire building. The problem is they're, and now they're like $10,000 a, a door. So it's kind of hard to like bite the bullet and be like, man, I got to put in six, ten thousand. Well, when it comes to filming and lighting, so well, confabulation. That's, well, we <laughs> knew that that door was going to be kind of the focal point. In hindsight, what I should have done is I should have put the porch on the other side. and then Like I, the um, the rear facing the home? Yeah, or? no, no, on that, like where the container is. I should have put that porch oh, next to the container. Okay. And then that way I could have like boxed it in and then had that been covered storage opposed from, because that's West facing. Right. And so that's another issue you got to think about. That's um, good. This is a great, know, uh, like when you, when, when you position the building on your property, you better stand out there on numerous days and figure out where the afternoon sun is and mm-hmm. where it hits. So in Texas, you want your building to face North and South. 
And then obviously you're not doing a lot of stuff in the summer on the west facing deal because it's real hot. Around two or three in the afternoon, this lights up. I mean, think about the front of this uh, where we're at in this podcast room is our office. It's a you know a barn that we converted into office space, but that front that door out there faces west, mm-hmm. and you see how much that wood gets beat up. I mean, it's the reason we put the garage yeah. doors in, just so that we could keep it cool. So uh, positioning the barn or the building so that your like most used area is not facing on that west side. I don't know where how Toledo is, but I know in Texas. You know, you don't like, remember we went to go look at homes and I'm like, dude, you're not buying a house that has a West facing backyard. Like if you, if your porch on your backyard is West facing, you're never going to fucking use it. Yeah. So, and it's just going to beat the shit out of your house. So positioning it, making sure you stand out there. I mean, we were, I remember Tom Dye saying, Hey, I want you to go out there and stand on that plot at dusk. I want you to stand there at first light and all during the day and see if that's exactly where you want it. So having a good indicator of it. Um, the other cool thing about building a big building like this is it adds a ton of value to your property. So when we did the building, I mean, obviously the slab was expensive, uh, the, you know, the red iron and the, and all the, pro, all the, uh, uh, materials were expensive, but then all the ancillary stuff like, uh, garage doors. Um, the fact that we have led overhead lighting, you know, I had my electrician buddy Ken come and he dude, he's like a wizard on bending conduit, ran all that straight conduit and you know, looks great put in the ceiling fan, ran all that, uh, all the light switches. And mm-hmm. then the, the bigger issue was we had to get uh, electricity to the barn. So the pole was 300 foot from the barn. So that was Tom Dye on a backhoe and Luke Summers and I basically ran that. I, I went down to, um, what was it? Uh, the electrician place here. I can't remember the name of it, but I bought Circuit all the, City. No, not Circuit City. It was like a light. Uh, Speaker City. Speaker City. It was like uh, whatever the outlet is for the electricians and bought all of that, con- all that wire and all that conduit. And then we futured and basically Tom dug it and Luke and, and I went out there, wrapped all that and then sleeved it in the conduit and basically ran it. And then we filled it all in. So we had to run like 300 foot of uh, conduit for that. And then Ken came up and hooked it up at the pole ran it through, did the grounding rod, got everything in, and then put in all the uh, um, outlet boxes. Should this guy with Ohio Winters keeping all the electric underground, did yeah. they get to this building? Yeah, I, I will always uh, underground electrical if I can. Um, the only thing, uh, all of our electrical is undergrounded other than when they... Um, so we ran into some issues when we first moved in here because the internet was so shitty. Remember? Yeah. So the internet was so awful, we couldn't work here. We actually had to work from like, remember Luke's house or like the other places or coffee yeah. shops. So it took me two years to dig them. They, I, I basically hit up Spectrum. We negotiated this deal and they dug us a fiber line. So that actual line that comes from the road, they cut that in and put it on poles. And then once it went to the pole over by where the electrical is over here, then they basically undergrounded it. And we have, I think we have one of the only hard fiber lines in this entire area. So, um, so much so that, uh, my neighbors are like constantly like, Hey, can we get your Wi-Fi password? I'm like, sure. If you can get it, you can get it. Um, but that was a big issue making sure that we had Wi-Fi, uh, making sure we had power. And then some of my machines were three phase. So I had to have a three phase converter cause they don't have any three phase out here. Um, but, um, if you're going to, so, uh, side note on the electric, like we got the, Badass tough tread in there. So the 220. Yeah. <laughs> How powerful a electric approach should this guy take? Just you anticipate normal because it's a little uh, home gym? Well, um, it, it really is. Uh, uh, I kind of subscribe a little bit with this stuff to uh, there's no such kill as overkill. Okay. Um, I don't think that like when it comes to like if, if you're going to build a building, right, and you're going to pay the money, like the money's going to be in the concrete. Like, uh, like the, you know, I mean, they might be shit 10,000 or 10 bucks a square foot to pour like legitimately, not just four inch, but I think I have six or seven, it wasn't eight. It was either six to seven inch thickness, 6,000 PSI, number three rebar, 12 inch centers. Normally they do 16. So I had them do more. And I think my slab was probably every bit of eight, nine bucks a square foot. So I think my slab alone was 45,000, 50 G's just for the slab. But I mean, it's a huge slab. I had all these special, you know, uh, you know, I knew I was going to put a lift in. I knew I was going to be in there dropping weights in this. I mean, we've dropped fucking barbells and been, you know, all this stuff. And if we pull those mats, there's not a single crack in that thing. 
So it was worth spending money on the front side to make sure that we had something that would survive the abuse. So I, I don't think that people future proof stuff. They're always looking to cut corners. And I think like at the end of the day, you're going to spend money. But then fuck, can you imagine pulling the pulling the rubber and all of a sudden just seeing the concrete cratering in? Not that no. it's going to happen. Yeah. But that's that that is a potential. So especially if you were to go real thin, like two or three inches, like you need at least six inches for a car lift. And I think we're seven. So when I was putting those uh, anchors in, I had to, you know, remember I had to get that big hammer drill. So that's a big issue. Um, your, your dough is going to be in the concrete because concrete's not cheap. And to get somebody to come out and level it and do a good job and shoot it, I mean, it's 900 square feet, 30 by 30, that's doable. But when you start talking about like 92 by 50, that's a big fucking piece. So um, then knowing that we want to have, because I mean, here here's the thing, my... Uh, uh, my old neighbor, rest his soul, fucking Tom Salty Die, he made a good point where he said, hey, if you're living out on one of these big properties and you have one of these buildings done, he goes, it adds exponential to your property because he goes, people got to have a lot of stuff. He's like, if you got a property, you're, you're going to have probably a skid steer or a mower or you're going to need this and this. I mean, these buildings are valuable and they're only going up. Like I think uh, Joe Martin from Iron Resurrection, Martin Brothers, who's the show that I was on, uh, he built a building and then six months later came back and the building price had increased by 40% just because of like, for like metal costs, concrete costs, rebar. I mean, all these materials. I mean, just the fact that like they build all the forms out of plywood and you saw what plywood went up to. So um, they're expensive. And then the fact that we did all the electrical, we, I, uh, I went and I picked up all the electrical, uh, Ken bent it all. I wired all of the plugs um, my boy Trevor, who uh, ended up doing the electrical at my house in uh, Newport Beach, uh, I was like his apprentice for three months, so I'm fairly decent on the electrical. And uh, so we got all that done. Um, I weld, so I was able to weld all the stuff in place for the overhead uh, for the uh, for the fan. And then uh, Ken installed the three phase converter. We did all the uh, all the metal stuff, so that was you know obviously our skills are on a scissor lift. You know that was originally. The power athlete intern test was uh, how well you manage a scissor lift because we were using a lot of them. So uh, then got the garage doors in. Um, the spray foam was a home run. You know, I like come from California. I never really had spray foamed anything. But walking into a building that had been spray foamed, it was about 20 to 30 degrees cooler than one that wasn't. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge deal because I knew that west, you know, that side of the building was going to get hot. And what's interesting is even though it gets hot in the building, it do, it, it's not bad. Like you turn on the yeah, fan, not and you're compared fine. to some of the other buildings. Like I've I've been in buildings that didn't that at bat or didn't have spray foam at all, and it was like, dude, you're in like a cool hand Luke in a box. So, um, I would look and say, all right, where do I want to put my money? I'm going to put my money into concrete, and then you know, obviously they're going to put up the red iron, then they're going to skin it. Uh, I would recommend doing spray foam just because I I, I think the insulation is such a such a factor. Not only for like uh, for weather and for heat and all the other stuff, but it just is so much nicer. Like you don't hear the noise; it's quiet. Um, and then you got to make sure. And then you're gonna have to figure out electrical. So you're gonna have to get the building wired. Do you have a pole that's close? Um, you know how jiggy do you want to get with all? I mean, we have switches and plugs. Every six feet through the entire building is a four is a four gang uh, uh, receptacle. Mm -hmm. And then we have, uh, you know, overhead LED lights. Um, and we got, what, six garage doors. Um, what else? Oh, a whole bunch of shop gear uh, that's I mean, able to operate. Yeah. So, I mean, but, you know, what's nice is we got enough tools to fix everything that gets mm -hmm. broken. Um, but I think if you're building that building, um, you're going to have to, uh, it, it's obviously different today. If you If, if I want to go build my building, Today, uh, I would add 40% to the price because uh, you remember like spools of wire, like I used to, you know, a, a big spool of wire, wire would be 30, 40 bucks. Now it's 117. Uh, the conduit's more expensive, everything. I mean, just production or the material cost is through the roof. Um, so uh, if you're going to do it yourself, um, there's some prefab stuff, but if you're going to do something kind of like, you know, engineered or what we did. I mean, they, you know, the, the red iron shows up and the dude basically cuts all the pieces with an oxycetylene torch and then puts it up and, and stick welded the whole thing. So, 
that's an interesting piece. How, how tall you want the roof, that's another issue. I think we have 16 feet at the peak and then it comes down to 12 on the sides. Mm-hmm. I wish I'd built the building taller, but at the end of the day, I like when I moved in, I didn't want to be the fucking asshole putting up a 20 foot building in the middle of uh, you know the country. But now with all the homes and everything around, I wouldn't have felt bad about it after seeing the monstrosity that Kathy put up for her, for her covered arena next door. Um, I do got to get, uh, then the other thing is once the building is poured or at the slab, what are you going to do for an apron? Like I came out and poured that apron around. I still have to extend it to the road. So I still got to get that guy back out to pour concrete, which I haven't been able to, um, just he's been so busy. So I think, um, go and look at some buildings, go yeah. look and talk to some people. I went out and looked at Joe Martin's building. I looked at Tom Dye's building. I went to two or three other people. Uh, I went and looked at like, you know, a big ass fans, macro air fans and kind of looked and saw what I wanted. And, uh, my recommendation, um, I don't know who's, uh, doing metal buildings in your area, but I definitely reach out and find out cause there's probably like a bottom tier, middle tier, and then there's a really high end one. And when I, when I price shopped it, the Mueller building, like it was more expensive, but not enough where you're like, Ooh, that's too much. Like it wasn't double. It was like maybe 10, 15% more. So it made sense to go and they, they had lifetime warranty on their powder coat. And so all the little things were really important for me in that way because I knew, hey, I'm going to build this building. Uh, it's going to add value to the property. You know, I mean, if we were to ever sell this place, I mean, we got a world class gym that's nicer than most things just in there. I mean, you know, so it's um, uh, I think all too often people. Like, you know, like, and you, you know, this with your home, you're adding value to your home by adding something like this. I mean, when people come and and look at a house, if they have like a badass 30 foot by 30 foot building on their property, that's got a gym and and some parking and all the other stuff. That's pretty nice because now you get to store your stuff in there. You don't have to put your mower in your garage or sit out. You can actually put your stuff, which is probably an issue in Ohio. And, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, crappy weather or storms or whatnot to be able to put your stuff inside, that's uh, super important. All right. I didn't expect us to go into the logistics of the building, but I learned a lot over here. Uh, The other thing, too, is permitting. Permitting. Okay. So uh, here in Texas, I um, we are uh, in the city of Austin, but we are not within like the confines. So I don't know with the permitting stuff like there was like. If we were within the city, we would have had a permit. But because we were in Austin ETJ, we just had to like let them know. So I think there's some interesting permitting stuff. So make sure it's permitted. Make sure you talk to your neighbors. Um, If you're going to put money, put your money into concrete and, uh, you know, and then find a, a, you know, a, a good building manufacturer, somebody that offers a warranty, you know, find a reputable builder if you're not going to build it yourself. I mean, at the time, um, I didn't have the you know, equipment to be able to weld up, weld up something like this. Now I would be able to do it no problem, but it's also nice to bring in professionals. They get it done in a few days, opposed from a few weeks when you're fucking hacking it together, which you saw here in our place. Um, I definitely invest in spray foam. Like I, I, I will never build a home without spray foam again. That closed cell stuff's money. And then uh, figure out how much juice you want to put into electrical and what you want to do for lighting. Um, I would err on the side of more lighting than not. Uh, it's kind of like a kitchen. I remember I built a kitchen years ago and the, the architect came in and he was like, show me. I'm like, why, why so many cans? He's like, dude, nobody complains about too much lighting. If you don't just turn it off, but like a, a poorly lit kitchen, it's fucking terrible. And so I think with the building being able to light it up, um, you know, and then just making sure that it's durable because a lot of things look good on the first day or even the first year, but 10 years from now, when you don't want it to show its age, you want it to look like, Oh shit, this has been nicely kept. It's well That's maintained good point. Yeah. and you want it to look good. And, uh, I think if you can do that, you're not only providing a place for you and your wife and your nephew to train that, you know, you'll have friends, it'll be a showpiece, but you're adding significant value to your property. Um, I have a, uh, my next door neighbor, Doug's a builder. And they haven't looked or he hasn't built a home or seen an architectural plan that did not include a home gym in over two years. He's like every single home that we look at has a provision, like not just like a nook where you can put like a fucking Stairmaster, but like everybody wants at least a room in their house with a dope gym, like enough Mm -hmm. to get a rack, like, uh, you know, nine foot to get a rack in and this. I mean, people like imagine a, a room that you could, you know, put barbells 
and train and lift. And like, that's become like, that's become the rule, not the exception. And Mm -hmm. when people are going to look at homes, the first question is, does it have a home gym? Like uh, the other one is, is pools. Like uh, it's pretty amazing. Like now, because pools are such in demand, because people obviously for COVID, we're spending so much time at home. Everybody wants a pool. Like now pools are are at such a premium. So I I don't think you'll go wrong. You're never going to regret building that building. And uh, to quote my old man, Tom Dye, once again, uh, cry once, buy once. Like don't cheap out. His his deal was like when it comes to like improving on your real estate, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, heavy equipment, tools. Like he he was a snap on guy. He was a he had more snap on than anybody I've ever seen. Uh, he was uh, you know had all of his stuff was cat stuff. Um, you know he had a, a you know cat uh, you know loaders. I mean had all that. And so he was kind of like, hey, if you're using this stuff every day, then in, invest in it and be happy about it. Don't cheap out and then be fucking mad that you got to kick yourself for being a cheap ass. That's a great transition into now. What goes into the wall, like in the gym, John? Ah, okay. So you have to make a decision on what you want. Uh, we did two Sornex base camps. So I wanted two really nice looking racks to kind of like the way I designed it in my head. We'd have the garage door with the aluminum, have the two racks side by side. Yep. And then from there, we, uh, you know, I had the mono from Power Athlete, and then we also had the Westside Belt Squat, so those flank. And then from check there, the show notes for a beautiful representation of this. Yeah, and then um, just wanted some other things, like I always wanted a lat pull down in a seated row, uh, you know. And then obviously the latest addition was the uh, Iron Grip dumbbells, which I've been lusting oh at for years. So we're waiting on the Sornex, uh, you know, uh, Iron Bears, which are the okay. racks for those. And then, uh, you know, we picked up some cool stuff. You know, we got that, uh, the tough tread, we got our, uh, true form. And then I have my various pieces of hammer strength equipment. I'm a huge fan of hammer stuff, but I only like their unilateral stuff. I like the, I, why? um, I feel like when you get into like things like a leg press or a, or a bench or some of this other stuff where the handles are joined, I feel like you can torque and you can use more pressure. I want to be able to like work each individual muscle mm-hmm. uh, by itself without the other one having carry over. And it just helps to fix imbalances. And, um, you know, and then you start looking for symmetry. Why is it I can push this one or do this and this? So um, I always liked the way hammer strength was built. I like their colors. I like the, you know, everything. So we got a hammer uh, ISO incline and we just picked up this badass um, seated isolateral leg press, which I'm super excited about. I've been searching for that thing for years. It is. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, we got a bench. We got a couple adjustable benches. We got a ton of bands. Uh, We also um, uh, reverse hyper, which Mm -hmm. was actually the first piece of equipment I ever bought when I opened my own gym. I bought uh, Westside Barbell reverse hyper. And uh, we have GHD. uh, Um, Belt squat. We got the belt squat. When did the belt squat come into play? So we went out to Westside Barbell. Um, geez, years ago, uh, this probably would have been right about the time we opened Little Power Athlete. So uh, we transitioned out of Balboa and, and opened up, you know, just uh, the place on uh, Monrovia. Mm-hmm. You know, me- remember the. the so this pack. was following when you, me, and Goodfellow went yeah. out there. Yep. Ah, okay. Yeah. So we were. So I, I had always wanted to get a belt squat. And Louie had been talking about it. And when we walked in, I, uh, you remember that uh, 400 meter runner girl uh-huh. who was just blowing that thing up and uh, everybody was standing around gawking. She was uh, built like a dump truck and in a good way, not a bad way. And uh, I went over there and I rapped with her a little bit and I'm like, hey, what piece of, or like what within your training within here, what's the most impactful piece? And she pointed to this and it's like the belt squad, I do everything on it. Remember she did the marches, she was doing all of her mm-hmm. uh, movement all that med ball work, everything. And she's like, honestly, um, I was a, a, a good runner coming out of high school. And now I've gotten into this like high end, you know, and I, I forgot what her time was. And if I said it, I'd be lying. Um, but it was enough for me to go home and order one. And then we started using it. And I've always liked the belt squad off the pulleys. Uh, when we went out to Naval Special Warfare and working with the guys out there um, in uh, at Damnick, uh, they had the pit sharks. Mm-hmm which I had never used and we were playing with them and like we just, you know, and those are lever based, uh, lever based belt squats. So after working with them, we came home, we got one and, uh, I'm, I'm, I am, uh, what's the right word? 
I don't need my ego stroked. Your team belt squat. Yeah, it's it's not good. But all of a sudden you get back on that pulley one, on that west side one, and that thing will fucking humiliate you. Uh-huh. So uh, all of these pieces of equipment, like whether it be the reverse hyper or the belt squat, uh, you know, the hammer stuff we have are all just icing on the cake. Right. Those are all just interesting pieces of equipment that we've acquired over the years that fit within a certain, you know, like training modality that we're using. I think between the base camps now, uh, you don't have to go all in and get the Sornex stuff. I mean, I, I dude, I am a Sornex fan girl, fanboy, how, at the highest order, uh, just because I really appreciate. I know Johnny the Fabricator, I know Bert, and I know the story, and like I love investing in like American companies that were like built out of garages that have a story, and they're friends of ours, mm-hmm. and I'm more than happy to fly their flag, um, and so much so that like. I was slightly jealous when all of a sudden, you know, Facebook Marketplace pops up and a Sornex base camp pops up in white and blue and I shot it over to you and you oh, yeah. up and got it. Immediately. Day of. Yeah. Oh, dude, that wouldn't have lasted. No. I mean, that, at that price point, I wanted it just yeah. to have it. And it was, I had to have it. It was meant to be. It was my college color arrangement. Yep. And, uh, Did you ever get that pull-up bar from that dude? No. He, <sighs> Too far to drive. Leander, get the fuck out of here. I stayed away from North Austin. The uh, But takeaways, two things. Number one, you stated like you got to know what you want out of this. Yeah. And the important thing for me is I wanted, I want all the equipment that I have to have a story uh, because I'm only in there once a week because sure. I have this wonderful have opportunity nice- to come Yep. each morning during the week and then the weekends are on my own and then what do i want to get out of it i got the opportunity to introduce the barbell to a lot of young men in my community so i'm going to take advantage of that so that's what i want and i want to have a story for the pieces of equipment those new iron grip dumbbells are beautiful john but not as beautiful <laughs> as the uh, gorilla cookies that have a storied uh, experience and and many a times been lifted uh, by some power athlete legends yeah the uh so I, I i collected this hodgepodge set of dumbbells like it was so hodgepodge uh like the the plated 130s 140s 150s i drove out to riverside and some dude was selling those like i don't know where they came from but the funny part was he didn't think anybody could lift them. So he disassembled them and like had them in boxes for the plates and everything to try to get somebody in there. And I was like, just load them in and ended up taking those home. And then those iron grips, which I I think might be knockoff iron grips because I dropped them and they bent them the first day. And the iron grips won't Everything's bend. Everything's fine. And then uh, we've just ordered them over course of time. And then finally, um, uh, Mike Rojas, who owns Iron Grip, who donated all those uh, uh, eight-sided plates that we have. Um, I hit up a buddy and was like, Hey, um, cause I like every couple of years, I'm like, Hey, can I get a price quote for a full set of dumbbells? And mm-hmm. I remember he was like, Hey, um, that quote will honor it, but just know it's going to go up 20%. If you don't order by today, you've been fucking kicking this around for years. So I finally placed the order and, uh, we waited and they came in and I like, I don't know why I waited so long. Yeah. I mean, it's it, like, they're really nice. So when those uh, iron bears show up, it's going to be so killer. And then, uh, what I like is with the iron bears with those storage, I get the dumbbells up. I can put all the center mass bells and all the all the uh, med balls up and get mm-hmm. everything off the floor. Because as you know, I hate things on the floor because what do they become? They just become spider, spider roly poly graveyards. Yep. Yeah. And so yeah. that's a big issue for cleaning. Um, for uh, so I think you have to decide. You know, like, hey, what's my budget? What do I want to get? Uh, I think you you got to get a rack. Um, yeah. I think you got to have some form of adjustable bench. Um, I think you got to have certain dumbbells. I would really like if I had a small uh, environment, I would get a set of the adjustable dumbbells, the uh, the power blocks. Yeah, yeah. Um, that if that's the buy once, cry once item. Well, the power blocks up to ninety are actually pretty manageable. Uh, I was all about the power blocks, and then I went up to like look at like I think the one thirties, one forties, the big ones. And dude, they are really hard to maneuver because they're so massive. This one, uh, Coach Cooch, Ben Cooch got. Got a pair of those. Oh yeah, they're they're not easy because your hands in the mid, like it's kind of uh, like to use the '90s was pretty easy. When you started going up and all the add-ons, like that was kind of like so. If if uh, you know up to 90 pounds fits, I would rather have like two sets of '90s than one set of 150s. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and then like if you really needed some heavier stuff, you could probably find a way or get the add-ons or whatnot. I just was surprised at how un, what's the word, like un, like kind of not manageable and just kind of awkward they were. Yeah. But I, I, I really dig them. I, I really like the the small footprint. And I think like getting a set of those would be really nice. Um, the, I mean, seeing some pop up on Facebook Marketplace, which note those prices are coming back down oh, from yeah. the yeah from from the panic the madness uh the other one um so we get into specialty bars so okay so specialty bars obviously you need a nice straight bar to pull with so uh we have a couple different ones we've got a uh, i think we've got a rogue bar we could definitely have that west side barbell deadlift bar and then i really like the kabuki bars so yeah. they're straight bars so we use those um, I years ago had a really nice Alico bar. I don't know Olympic lift, so I don't necessarily use it anymore. If Olympic lifters show up, I'm like, use the Alico. I have it. Um, so we got that bar. Uh, then we have, well, uh, we have the, uh, a pretty bitchin' trap bar. So I don't know if you guys know the story. We talked about it with Jeff Gonzalez, or I didn't tell, talk about it on the podcast. But years ago, Jeff showed up to train with me. He was doing a shooting deal, and we were trap bar deadlifting. And it was actually one of those enclosed trap bars. Mm-hmm. And on the last rep of like 10, it fell out of my hand and the back hit first and then spun forward, landed on the top of my toe and broke my toe. So I never touched it with another trap bar. And finally, we got that Prime Fitness one that's open. Mm-hmm. Or I, no, no. Intech. Yeah, we got the Inatech. But the problem in it. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> you know what Inatech is? I do. Office okay. space. Office space. So the bar, though, the problem is, is the way they had it is, is it came in a bunch of different pieces and then it had the sleeve. The problem is, is we got heavier, the sleeve started to torque and there were some technical things why we didn't like using it. Um, then we ended up getting that Prime Fitness trap bar, which is fucking really nice. And then when Duffin showed up, uh, he shipped us out a Kabuki bar mm-hmm. for us to play with. So we got that in there. And then um, I really like, I mean, really when it comes down to specialty bars, I think a trap bar is really good. Because what I'm excited about having two different trap bars is now we can pull heavy and then we can do trap bar jumps. Yeah. Uh, so I like that. Um, then the other one, I'm a huge fan of the safety squat bars. Yeah. So we had the original Hatfield one, which we've talked about at nauseum on this podcast. Um, I got the Elite FTS one. The only issue I ran into with the Elite FTS is the pad is so thick that it pushes you, it pushes the bar so high up on your neck that when you get to the bottom of the squat it feels like it's pushing your head forward with like some form of like, you know, uh, like, um, like shear, like cervical shear. So that's kind of an interesting piece. So I ended up having to push it up. So I either want to like remove some foam out of it, or maybe we got to like leave it out in the sun to get it to break down. So it sits lower. Okay. Uh, but then we have the Kabuki transformer bar, which I think is fucking genius. And then also Chris Duffin sent us another Kabuki transformer bar to play with because now it, uh, they've, they've gone back and redefined or redesigned it and, and fixed some of the issues that they thought they had. Um, and then uh, we have a football bar, but then we also, nice thanks to Kabuki, sent us the Cadillac bar. So we were playing with that today. And I think that Cadillac kind of football bar with the arc is really interesting. I'm excited to play with that a little bit more. So um, we have, a, um, I think, a, a trap bar, a straight bar, a trap bar, I think some form of safety squat bar. And if you're having any shoulder issues, maybe some football bar might be a benefit. Mm-hmm. And he mentioned him and his nephew doing field strong. So I got, uh, so we talked about bars, balls, mm, yeah. medicine balls, and boxes. Yeah, so I think you need one heavy uh, ball to slam. I think you need one ball that's light, like a 12 pounder which we use which i really like for the med ball work because you can get so much acceleration mm-hmm. um so with and also a reactive wall so maybe yep. s- build a small cinder block reactive wall not t- to touch your nice building yeah uh that'd be a, probably an easy construct yeah uh and then uh, something to jump on over yeah that could you could re utilize your your benches for your bench bet but i recommend yeah we uh years ago um you know when uh, we were doing box jumps a ton uh, we had wooden boxes that we built the problem is we ended up denting our shins so much so that i got tired of like people having these like war wounds i had a lady do a box jump split her shin open had to go get stitches and she's like uh, i'm going on vacation i'm supposed to be wearing a dress at that point when we, we bought the padded boxes 
which I think the company doesn't even, uh, Muscle Driver isn't even around anymore. They, they do not exist. Um, but yeah, we got those badass muscle driver, uh, stackable plyo boxes, mm-hmm. which I think are, are like home runs. I'm, I'm sure some yeah, company has oh, taken yeah, dude, over that. I'm, I guarantee somebody has the, uh, I found my most proud find within the garage gym is that the Sornex step up 2005 Sornex adjustable box jump. But as you know, any new piece of equipment we get either practice stepping up on or use to make step ups more challenging. Sure. So that's doubles down as the step up sprint tool that as well nice as piece. box jump. I, I would have liked to have that in my gym, but um, I deferred on that one as well. Um, I think because I search gym equipment on Facebook Marketplace, all this stuff gets forwarded to me. It pops up and then I send it to you. Yeah. And so, uh, final note for field trunk sprint, sprint space. Yeah. Uh, so in the back of the building, um, I, when I uh, got done, you know, obviously pouring the slab, I graded the back of the building. Um, it was actually much different. I don't know if you remember it, but I graded it much slower. The problem is we've had so much runoff that now it's pretty rocky. I got to go back there and regrade it. Uh, but we've graded it to kind of do one of these. So remember it kind of starts flat and then it kind of like goes up. So now you, you start getting a good amount of running. And then it's, I think it's 32, 35 yards from the fire pit, the burn pile to the top of the building, which mm-hmm. is pretty good for, for sprinting uphill. So we got a place to run. Um, the only thing that I regret not doing, and I, it would be very difficult to do it. I mean, I could do it, but it'd be a pain in the ass. I didn't put a bathroom in up at the gym. I mean, we got well, a bathroom down that here. That was Mr. Tom Dye's advice, right? Well, he said, he's like, don't put in a bathroom. People will never leave. So he got rid of the bathroom in his building so that when people would say, hey, can I use the bathroom? Be like, no, you got to get out. But like, that's an old man. Uh, <laughs> we have to get porta potties for events. It would have been nice to put in like, a two stall bathroom just off of the corner that was real nice that people could go in and use um, instead of sending them down here or whatnot. So I think that was a tactical error on my part. Um, I, I, you know, I had uh, Tom's a septic guy. He could have cut the septic in, tied it right in to the deal, and it would have been perfect. But uh, I had listened to him on that one, and that was a regret. So I think uh, when it comes to equipment, you know. I mean, I think you, you got to get the basics. You got to have bars. You got to have plates. You're going to have a rack. You got to have a bench. Uh, if you want to, if you got some extra cash, you want to get some specialty bars. Um, I really, at this point, man, like uh, I think the Kabuki bars, I mean, and I'm not just saying it because he sent us stuff. I mean, we bought all of his stuff beforehand. A really high end, really nicely well thought out. Yeah, I, the, I really just appreciate the engineering and the attention to detail. The only thing that I've <laughs> personally bought new kettlebell kings kettlebells i like the competition yeah. uh, style and i know that i'm going to use those forever so we have center mass bells from sornex mm-hmm. and we got a bunch of kettlebells which are cool and then i went over kettle when kettlebell kings was local here in austin you could go over and pick them up and not have to pay for shipping which they give you a reduced price that's when i bought the 203 uh, the 150 and then the 100 and uh, i think i picked up those three from them and those have been really valuable so I mean, center mass bells, some kettlebells, adjustable dumbbells, uh, straight bar plates, um, and and a rack and an adjustable bench, and you're pretty far along. If you want to add some specialty bars, I think there's some bitch and stuff. Yeah, uh, mini tramp for yeah. your, if you're field strong and yep. training your nephew at a sprint. It's a cool tool. Uh, I'll tell you, though, the one that we use a ton that, I mean, I could probably build for about 20 bucks worth of steel is the hamstring roller from Sornex. <laughs> so I use that thing. Well, yeah, you got to borrow the wheels from your rollerblades, right? Yeah. So, well, yeah. So you basically take rollerblade wheels and we could, I mean, it's just angle iron and some flat plate, but uh, I really dig it. I like, we started hooking it up to a band and working on like really holding at the top. And there's a ton of stuff on Jack street where we're doing a bunch of like just hamstring murder stuff. And dude, that hamstring roller is fucking legit. Uh, Sound system. So you want to have, you know, we got a TV set up. It's wired up to some speakers. One of which is, only working. I don't think one of them is working. So we got to figure that piece out. But what I did is uh, I welded some plates and, and made some stands to basically get those things up because I didn't want them on the floor. Uh, we put a couple lockers in um, and dude, for the most part, I really can't think of anything else we would add to the gym. We're obviously going to jettison that uh, pit shark and we'll move the leg press in over there. But other than that, I really, oh, we do have the uh, flywheel coming. Mm-hmm. Um, the Kratos Kabuki flywheel, which I am super excited about. 
I mean, when we first saw your boy, the uh, Phoenix. Corey Schlesinger, go Suns, by the way. Yeah, we saw Corey fucking around with that flywheel. Like instantly, we had like a million different ideas. And the fact that like that flywheel, you know, is able to force on eccentric load, you can kind of, uh, it's really, really fascinating piece of equipment. So uh, I think we hit up that company and we're trying to get them on the podcast to learn more about it. And I think they ghosted us. And then, you know, when I saw that Kabuki came out with one, I was, dude, I I was more than happy to throw down some cash to be able to test that, get rid of that belt squat and see how we use that thing. Uh, I think it's really pretty fascinating for just uh, force decentrics. Oh, yeah. And then isometric contractions, like getting it wound up and then forcing that uh, isometric. So being able to add some more elements to the French contrast and uh, some of the triphasic stuff we've been playing with. Mm -hmm. And I mean, once your guinea pig nephew is ready, get that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I like at the end. And then what's cool is. If you ever go do sell it, right, you can probably sell it with the gym in it. And, 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 you know, like, I mean, like I, like I think about for me personally, if I went to go look at a home, like I wanted to buy a home and they had a nice building that was set up, that would be like a number one selling point for me. I'd be like, okay, what does the kitchen look like? Cause if you notice you hang out in the kitchen, uh, I'm always amazed where people are like, oh, the bedroom's kind of small. I'm like, how much time do you spend in the bedroom? I mean, you sleep in there. But it's not like you're just hanging out in your bedroom. So I'm always amazed by like, like at least if I were to build a house and I have, I, I would have like a big kitchen, big kind of like just big kitchen, big uh, table area and, you know, smaller bedrooms, but like a big ass bathroom. I think I, I, I always walk into big bathrooms. I'm always like, oh shit, these are not, this is a big bathroom. Um, having plenty of closet space. I've been in homes that like his and hers closets. It's nice to have a big closet, even if you don't have a lot of clothes, just to go in there and not feel like you're like searching for stuff. Uh, but I think for a building, you're not going to regret it. I think the only thing you're going to regret is if you cheap out on some stuff. So spend some money. Um, don't go into it thinking like, how cheaply can I do this? I do that, but I do it with like, what can I do myself? Like it's, I think people cut corners on certain things like uh, we did all the electrical wasn't necessarily because uh, I was trying to cut corners. Just it was because we had the ability to do the electrical. I can't even imagine what the electrical would have been to be able to run that to the building. So, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, there's there's some ways to be smart if you're fairly handy. And if you're not, then you know what? Then pay somebody to do it and hope they do a good job. Man, that was a really pretty long winded. I, I, they I asked us. I it's their fault. <laughs> it's their fault that they fired it up. And they, I mean, I got a lot of opinions when it comes to to building buildings and gyms. I mean, oh, dude, yeah. Think about think about how many how many gyms I've built, right? So uh, the initial uh, Balboa, and then we moved to Big Balboa, and then we moved to where Balboa is now. Uh, we had Little Power Athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, all the other gyms that we helped put put together came and built a building and built a gym in it. As well as traveled to 200 oh. gyms and realized, awesome, awful, sucks. Uh, that's a great way to think about this. The biggest one that's my pet peeve, and you, you heard me say it, is I hate when they put the floor mats and they butt corners up, like four corners. So what you do is you stack them like bricks. So, so you ah, lay right, one, right, right. you cut the first one in half, and so basically there's a corner. You know, I'm tracking. Yeah, so like... You lay them like bricks. And so I've walked into gyms where they have basically laid it all like one whole thing. And then they do it and they're all stacked up next to each other and there's corners. Dude, that looks awful because the corners never match. No. And then it just throws the OCD off. So you got to like lay one row, cut the next one, and then stagger it like bricks. And when I walk into a gym that's been staggered, I know this person switched on and not a dumb fuck. What's off the top of your head? Do you remember the nicest gym you ever traveled to? Um, the nicest gym we well the biggest gym we ever went to was uh was Froyo's gym, Rich Froning's. That's right. That was I mean that was that was a really very nice gym. beautiful. And yeah, that was a big gym. Maximus. Yeah, across, I mean, do you remember they had that mayhem, huge, mayhem? Mayhem. They had that huge. Maximus turf area. Is, is Lexington. Lexington. Remember they had a huge turf area. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think one of the nicest gyms we ever went to was uh, that one in New York City. Was that Brick? Brick. Brick yeah. was pretty well. They they had a lot of high dollar stuff in there. Yeah. Um, what else? Drake's uh, Drake's in Nuremberg was. Uh, you weren't on it, but Butcher's Lab in Denmark was incredible. 
that was a really nice gym. Um, they had like uh, fucking like eighteen hundred members or something, yeah. some some astronomical amount. Um, who else had a really nice gym? The second South Korea, it was No No and I. That was extremely switched on, and then we scheduled a. They had they had built a new facility. I had toured it, and it was like world class spa, up to date. And we set up the third soul seminar there, but then just didn't didn't sell didn't it. catch fire, so we couldn't go. Yeah, but the uh, that would have been. I'm trying to think. Um, man, what was uh? I'm trying to think of the gym that we did in Spain. Just thinking of the European ones. I remember the yellow one, like lots of yellow. Yeah, but then you did a Spain with Cali. Yeah, I did, and I cannot remember what that gym looked like. Well, Cape Town was beautiful because it was, they did very smart, intelligent. It was all, all windows. windows. Yeah. So then you're looking at tabletop mountain and man, it was just, it was awesome. Uh, my most favorite gym was old CrossFit San Francisco or San Francisco CrossFit when it was in the parking lot of the sports basement. So Kelly Starrett started San Francisco CrossFit in the corner of sports basement's parking lot with a container and a makeshift like lean to roof. And dude, it was it was epic. Like they opened that container, brought all that equipment out, people just out there killing themselves. San Francisco, six in the morning, fog, view of Golden Gate Park and the Golden Gate Bridge. And dude, it was it was badass. I mean, like they you know, they since moved the Presidio, which was really nice and since since shut down, and that gym was really switched on. Mm-hmm. But I think the original magic from CrossFit or San Francisco CrossFit at, at the uh, sports basement was was legendary. So there's a um, you know there's a ton of history. Oh man, um, Zach Zach Forrest's gym. Oh yeah, Max Effort. Max Effort. That was, was nice. Really nice. Uh-huh. Um, you know, and then also what was the one we did down in Miami? I, I did Miami with Goodfellow, and yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, so I mean, we we were really fortunate to travel. To some I am CrossFit, time. something like that. Um, it was like I am for you CrossFit. I don't know Asuna, or, or, right? Yeah, yeah, Mike. Yeah, yeah, Mike yeah. Asuna. So, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we were super. He's fortunate. still killing it. Well, he, yeah, he's, he looks great. Yeah, looks great. Uh, but yeah, they. Uh, I think having the opportunity to have toured a lot of gyms. Uh, the one thing um, I have always hated about gyms is they just get really dusty in the places you can't reach. That's why I was so big on uh, spray foam and then Galvalume sheeting the inside so that there was nowhere to hide for the, you know, I mean, obviously we, you know, clean it, but like we can wipe the walls down. So mm-hmm. I think making it cleanable on the inside is That's huge. good note. Like that was what, what I wanted. I wanted to be able to wipe that stuff down. Um, uh, that ceiling fan makes a huge difference. Um, I also noticed, and this is purely just observational, the people that had the ground, uh, like the fans by the window or by the doors on the ground, uh, when they, and uh, we, we had them at Balboa, we would have those shooting in. For some reason, all the equipment rusted. Huh. When we did the ceiling fan, the roof fan, we've never had that issue. So for some reason, uh, when the air gets pushed down from the room, but when you're pulling air in from the outside, there's something within, I don't know, like humidity. I, I don't know uh, exactly why, but when we put those in, everything rusted. All the bars rusted. Everything was rusty. So that's a big issue. Um, if, if you're in a really wet environment uh, near the ocean and there's salt or like here in Texas where it's just hot, uh, you know, definitely you're going to have to be proactive in making things uh, sure they're powder coated and no raw steel or you're going to be really unhappy. Mm-hmm. So there's a pretty bitch and spray that I have that's almost like an aerosol of uh, like it's uh, like almost like an aerosol beeswax. Does that even make sense? But yeah, what I use it, I use it on bare metal to make sure things don't rust. So I use it on all my welding tables. I'll wipe them all down and then I shoot that stuff with them and uh, it's pretty good. So I'll, I'll use that on the bars when we go clean them and that, that keeps them pretty nice. Sweet. Cool. Well, damn you for asking questions. Asked and answered. Winding us up, but also thank you. Well, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Power Athlete Radio. How about this, John? How about if you have a badass home gym? Oh. Share it on, click the show notes, share your badass home gym. And or we'll put them on Instagram. Yeah, we'll, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll or, find a way or, to get it to them. Or. Because uh, they can leave the comment with the picture. Uh, or. Badass. Just tag us and we'll aim to collect 
So how about hashtag Power Athlete Home Gym? Let's do it. I'm excited. And then we'll, we'll start collecting them. Yeah, no, I'm excited to see what you guys are working with. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's a Taj Mahal or just, you know, a one room, uh, you know, closet with a few bars in it. We want to see it. Um, I'm always excited to see where people are training and getting it done. Yeah, yeah. We we did a call to action. I'm going to link up the blog post that was essential equipment for your home gym. That's our Power at the blog. And we asked for some home gyms, Henry Rosario, a few other dudes. T- Dude, Henry's got a badass gym. Yeah. Uh, so that's that, featured there and yeah, we'll, that we'll wood add on to the wall it. was really nice. He's done well. Yeah. Awesome. I, uh, I dude, I always love, dude. I, I am forever a fan uh, when I see, you know, people tag me and stuff or, you know, people doing the training program and I get a chance to drop in and see their home gyms and they're really nicely put together and well thought out and cool. Like I'm fucking so excited to see it. And on top of it, I'm super jacked. I'm like, fuck man. That's like, uh, you know, the uh, at this point in 2021, a nice home gym is a serious flex. You can leave the fucking Lamborghinis and Ferraris. I want to see your home gym. Oh, you got a nice car? Show me your home gym. Oh, you don't like you got Sornex? Let's see. You got Clear Grind? What you what you working with? Yeah, I'm just going through it. But that's it. We'll uh, hashtag Power Athlete Home Gym. We'll tool them up and get them out to the world. That's it. We're out. See you. Bye. Bye.